so the the next the next one yeah <laughs> here we go we're gonna start out with systemic gameplay stream of thought which uh, like uh, i just said i hope is not a stream of thought of only tony z i think this is the panel that's supposed to be um i didn't expect anything kind with of server meshing or sq42 and i was still disappointed <laughs> yeah here we go it's an hour and 34 minutes Hi, I'm Tony Zervek, Director of Persistent Universe for Star Citizen. Today I'm going to tell you about some of the new technology, features, and content that we're aiming to deliver over the next several quarters, and how these things are going to impact your gameplay experience. To assist in that endeavor, I brought along a few others to give you some additional perspective, including SGS Assistant Director Rob Reininger, Senior Systems Designer Ben Dorsey, and over Sorry, in the I UK, just to make sure designer the Luke playback Presley. speed was at normal, because I thought it was fast. Rob, we've been able to buy and sell commodities for years, but we're now looking to try and close out the entire loop by the end of the year by allowing players to sell weapons, armor, clothing, and eventually ships back to the shops. One of your favorite aspects of this has always been what it means to treasure. Can you elaborate a bit on that? I think it's huge because now it gives me a purpose to go out and collect the stuff because players are very meticulous. They'll go out and pick up every single gun, weapon, armor off of other players. Like loot generation is something that the Frankfurt team is working on. Uh, it means a lot for you know investigating lockers or just stripping down something we talk about salvage you know they, these are all things that are working towards the ability to buy and sell items but most importantly it's just curating your inventory right it's it's getting rid of the stuff it's another form of reward so I, I think it's a huge addition to the game sure and it also plays a big role in character advancement right yeah. because you can realize the equity from items that you've purchased in the past in other words i i buy a particular laser rifle now i decide that i want the better one i don't have to buy that one starting from scratch i can actually sell my original one assuming it's in pretty good shape and i basically pick the optimal shop at which to sell it you know that's a Okay, he's already going off, but, like, I gotta stop in one spot. He's already going insane. So, he, he said, I want the better one. Like, the problem with the game is there isn't the better one. Like, you have your preference, I think. I think most most people have their preference or <laughs> just the pause is, is ridiculous the the preference of um what weapon you like but all of them are all pretty usable in game i think that there's like metas but that's not really what they're going for would be my guess so there's so much missing from the game uh like when if selling comes first it's not going to have a use case because nothing really matters but i do agree that like if there's a selling value to each item, then it, it does give a monetary value to it, but the game needs to give a gameplay value to each item for it to actually matter to the player. Um, you know, this is a better gun because it has a, you know, a better recoil rate or something like that than the other version of it. So, you know, a shop that deals in that specific item, then I can actually get a pretty good price for that used item. I can then take that money and apply it and, you know, the differential towards moving up the ladder and basically getting better yeah. and better stuff. And so just like in the real world, it's like there you don't no usually start from, you know, from scratch and buy, you know, buy a There's house no and then basically, you know, uh, have to, you know, buy another one from scratch. You basically take your, you know, realized equity in your original and you throw it into the other one and you just Remus. pay the difference. Yeah, and that's something that we don't have in the shops right now. Everything is, is in the shop on a per item basis and items sometimes come with default loadouts on them like a sniper rifle or a set of armor or uh, ships are a great example of something that comes with the default loadout of certain laser cannons and power plants and etc so ships are a good example as we go forward with selling one of the things that we want to do is get an itemized value. price for every single attachment that's on an item which includes laser scopes magazines uh, any uh, underbarrel attachments right things like that so now that these have their own individual price, it's much easier for us to one, tune the economy. So now it's this thing is more expensive or less expensive. As stats change, we can, we can keep up with the, the statistical improvement of 
the item on a per item basis. Sure, you have the macro item, it consists of the child items. We changed the price of the child item and the, you know, the macro item, the, big, the large item that includes you know, various quantities of this, its price is automatically adjusted, which is not something that happens now and causes us countless problems. Yeah, and, and it means that now we, we have less moving parts to, to worry about on a, on a global basis. All right, and I think I figured it out. From a what is I think I got it all figured out. Tony Z is actually an NPC, and what he's doing is just creating uh, a place where he can upload his fucking brain into the video game and then, like, live on forever. Like, it's got, he's got to be. What does the world uh, have for sale in it? You know, you talked about, you know, taking something to a shop that deals in those items. That's, it's kind of the concept of, well, this shop deals in it and they refurbish it. They have an invested uh, value in procuring those things back from people in the universe. So we want to encourage players to go around to the different places that have the best price for it, much like commodity trading, right? We, we want players to go here because they can buy it for the best price, go here because they can sell it for the most money. A lot of it's a hoax. Uh, it's same a hoax. principle I mean, for selling money items, making right? industry, so okay. This shop deals in it. You should be able to go there and get more money for sure, it. Sure, and we, and we need this more you know, sophisticated method of determining the pricing of the more complicated items, you know, that are composed of lots of child items, partially because of what it means to selling. In other words, I, when I go to sell my, you know, my, my pistol, I may have a custom scope on it, something for which we don't have a specific entry in our, you know, global retail products list and that says this item should, if it were new, cost this much. This I winds up becoming something to where, well, sure, we've got the base price of the pistol and we've got the base price Price, yo, uh My whole world just crumbled below me in this moment here. I was originally drawn to Star Citizen because there was no player economy. I thought it was a better idea for them, for the, for the game company to kind of run the economy. But now I'm realizing that they're determining the value of... The people who don't play the game are determining the value of all the items in the game. At least the base value. And not the players. And I that can't possibly be a good thing. Of, you know, of the scope, but we don't have any sense of what the combination is. As of right now, we don't have a means of solving that. And so this, this is why we, you know, we are going to be pursuing changing even how the shops specify their default you know, inventory. Like right now, we actually have shops Got the specify individual every entries, individual yeah. item that they can sell as opposed to where we're going is it'll be classes of items. This, you know, yeah. this particular shop deals in, you know, in, in small handheld weapons, uh, you know, from this particular manufacturer. Now, because they actually deal in small handheld weapons, they will, in fact, purchase, you know, small handheld weapons from a different manufacturer. Right. You just won't get, you know, quite as good a price because they're not as adept at repairing them and they don't have a clientele that's, you know, that's geared towards purchasing those items, etc. You, if you wanted to realize, you know, the best possible price, then you would wind up taking your, you know, your your specific, you know, items to a shop that dealt in those specific things, that's right. and that's where, assuming the condition was perfect, and assuming that the shop had a lot of cash on hand with which to procure these deals, and so was willing to be a little bit more liberal, that's where you could potentially recoup, you know, 70, 80, you know, you know 85 percent of your original value. Whereas if you go to someone that simply, you know, sure they, you know, they deal in small arms but not necessarily that that's you know that particular manufacturer not, you know that particular caliber weapon or whatever the case may be then maybe you only get 40 or 50 cents on the dollar exactly it's like when you're dealing with a car dealership like if you bring them their their brand of car they're going to pay you more for that than if you brought it's, them it's easier right for them to service their exactly. mechanics are already familiar with it they can do the They've work the at parts. cost they can sell it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly totally no, makes sense. it's it's big and it's something that it just feels natural right it's how the world really works and we want to continue to, to push that forward. But how the world really works is God doesn't determine the value of everything.
the people in the world do. 3.15 is a huge update to the game because of the localized inventory that's going to totally the change part. the game. There are several aspects to this, and that starts with, I'd say, the personal inventory manager that Rich Tire and the actor feature team have put so much work into. They're going to cover that in a separate discussion, so we'll leave that out of, you know, uh, out of here. Um, on, over on our side, we've got the vehicle loadout manager, which has been adapted to al only allow you to modify vehicles that are in your immediate vicinity. And then we've also added a new Moby Glass app called Knickknacks. Um, Reiniger, so you've spent the last couple of quarters heavily focused on this. Go ahead and walk us through what's changed, starting with the front end menu. Yeah, so the front end, we've God historically allowed to players GPUs to kind of go wherever they want, right? <laughs> but as we move forward with the game and the new player experience, we want players to be invested in their home location. So it's, it's more of selecting a home base because the inventory that you have at the start of your account that's entitled, you know, through all your web purchases, through whatever, you know, subscriber flares, et cetera, all of this stuff is going to go to that location as it's physicalized in the world. So now, you have a home base of operations. That's your place. As we explore out throughout the universe, you may move some of that stuff to a new place as you get persistent halves here, a new hab over there, persistent hangar, right? Uh, players are gonna be tangibly going up to, interacting with their, their weapon rack, interacting with the stuff in their ship. And so localized inventory is a massive change to how they've dealt with the game in, up till now. Uh, gone are kind of the days of this global inventory that you can go and, and interact with anywhere in the universe. If your stuff is at Microtech, you need to go to Microtech to do it. If it's in this hangar over here, you got to go to that hangar. So we want players to feel the, the pressure of prepping for a trip, right? It's, it's as you go out, this is the mission I'm going to do. This is what I need to go and do that mission. So I want to go here, get this, get this, or maybe go to a shop here and buy that. Uh, and so the front end is going to be the, the first step in kind of planting your seed uh, wherever it is in the universe from the very start. So what about the Knickknacks app? So this, this allows you to basically, in its first incarnation, to see where you've placed all of your sure. loot throughout the entire solar system. It works on a hierarchical basis, so you can drill down into right. a particular planet, see you know the city. At the city, you can basically see what ships you have stored there. You can look within your ship and you right. know, eventually see you know, what cargo grids and you know, what, what you know, storage closets you have within there and what items you have placed within there. You've also got a number of filters that allow you to quickly drill down through your entire inventory and find you know all the you know the laser rifles or whatever else it is that you're you know specifically searching for can you just you know walk this is another one of those things that they're going to spend a lot of time talking about like how big of a deal it is because it was really difficult for them to probably make right it was a lot of work and and stuff for them to make but this is something that is just like going to be something we glance over in six months because we're so used to using it Walk through that in a little bit more detail. As we kind of go into the localized inventory, the, the VMA can only act on the ships that are at that location. Uh, the You kind of lose perspective of the global view because the personal inventory I like manager the idea that the of preparing for your journey has right removed the, the PMA, job. which was also your I kind of that, I love uh, that global view into your personal I items. I want so the more of that. Knickknacks app allows you to kind of see where your stuff is distributed around the world uh, at the individual location level. So whether it's in a ship or in a hab or in a hangar, uh, right now- that, that immediately goes into exactly what I'm talking about, where these specific boots on screen might have value over another boot. So like that, like I think in a game where these boots don't have, you know, plus 20 to, you know, your your speed because it's not like an rpg in that way the 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 qualities of each item need to have use cases and that and that's the only way to give them that value now the locations are, are basically cities or stations pretty much any place that has a shop that sells items that can be some place where you can store stuff so the the ships also have their local inventories associated with them so you can store things in the ship and the, the Knickknacks app is, is good because now you, if you want to find laser rifles, you've got, you can search by type or, or subtypes, uh, basically the, the same things that you see in the shop, so the categories that you see in the, in the shop UIs, uh, that's the same level of, of interaction and, and filtering that you'll have in Knickknacks. We've spoken a bit about how it's going to evolve in the future and what new capabilities we would wind up adding to it, you know, trading you know, with other players is one of the things that's at the top of the list.
Yeah, right, right clicking on something, being able to say, hey, open a trade window with, with Ben here. Uh, I want to be able to show me on the star map where this is. So yeah, we, we, something that we want to do in the mobile glass as a whole is context ability to bounce to different apps that are, are you know, contextually relevant to whatever you're currently using. So, Like saying this is in this location when that's just a string, like it's in Olasar, that's not super useful. Seeing that on a map, that tells me something. That tells me I need to go from here to here. I need to plot this location. Right. I'm going to go through this dangerous area to get there in order to access my stuff. Or, and, or and a hyperlink on that. Yeah, and, yeah, and, right? and you can also very easily discern you know, distance and stuff, which is, yes. oh, well, this one's not here, but very... is it relatively close yeah. or is it really, really far away? And I need to be able to obviously you know, put that into my Planning. Yeah, or set a route to see how much fuel I'm going to use. Exactly. Right? There, there's a lot of different reasons why these things are, are kind of relevant. We want to try and preserve all those elements that CR really wants to push towards, but still give you the context switching that you're going to need. Okay. I don't know. I just... The complexity of that, I feel like, doesn't need to be incredibly high, and I feel like they're probably trying to make it more complex than it really needs to be, but who knows? They know more than I do. Another area that's currently under heavy development is physicalized cargo. It consists of multiple facets this and will be released in stages, with the first one relating to shop purchases injecting physical entities rather than what I would call render proxies into your ship. This is going to convey God, all sorts of rate. benefits and advantages you know, to the gameplay experience. The first and one of the most obvious is simply the fact that now that you've got a ship that has physical entities you, placed within it, Don't then think. when another player winds up disabling, boarding your ship, they can actually extract you know, that cargo from you. There's value there that they can actually take. Whereas right now, the only way to get that value is you have to you know, blow up the ship, and then we basically yeah. you know, create you know, these, these, these cargo yeah, facsimiles that together. basically get blasted out into space and you have to go collect those, you know, yeah. et cetera. And so this starts to hint at things like, you know, uh, the fact that we're going to want to bring NPCs into defending these ships. So all of a sudden, yep. you get this fantastic gameplay transition, what I would say, where you have ships doing this momentum-based combat, mm -hmm. and now I can disable a ship, board it, and I actually have to overcome the NPC crew and then physically grab the cargo, haul it back to my ship. At the same time, you're concerned that while you're basically on the ship and lugging this stuff around, that security or you know allies of the ship that you've disabled might show up and start blasting you. And so all of a sudden, the considerations, uh, you know, just explode, you know, for doing something so right now relatively basic. And it's, it's one of the aspects that I really love of, about this game, which is how we can add this low level gameplay mechanic and, it, you know, in one shot, it's going to totally transform so many different, you know, elements of the yeah. game. And we get stuff like the whole sea, which, you know, is an, another hurdle beyond the physicalization of cargo. Uh, I think one of the things that, that just physicalizing the cargo really does is it allows for the gameplay that CR wants where you're not blowing up ships, right? You're destroying an engine, which is not a critical failure, right? Critical failures are the things that lead to these larger scale destructions, but on average, you're hot. knocking a ship out of commission. You're able to board, you're able to acquire the stuff. You're not killing everybody on the ship just because it, it got taken down to zero health, right? Um, so the, these are all things that just physicalizing the cargo allows us to do. You mentioned the whole sea. So the whole sea has some unique challenges related to attaching physicalized cargo to it when you're actually you know, docked at a station or when you're you know, parked in a hangar and its wings are compressed. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so the whole C, because it, it does have these two different states, uh, now we have ATC considerations. If I have cargo on the outside of my ship, my wings are exposed, now I can only go to these a docking are old collar. Images. I can't go to the hangar. So the ATC needs to know to route you to these different locations. Uh, showing all this cargo on the outside of a ship beyond, you know, think of adding additional ships to an area and, and the kind of, you know, uh, slowdown that you might see on, on a server, right? You're adding more physical objects that, that, that can be blown up, can be interacted with. So there's a technical challenge that we need to overcome as well. Uh, how they get on there, these, these are shipping container sized objects that have a, a real world weight to them. They need a tractor beam that, that is large enough 
probably on an Argo ship, right? Uh, so you, you'll get these little transport ships going from a stations, docking, you know, a cargo bay, flying it out to the whole sea. And, st you know, think of it as a person walking in and out, but it's, it's on a, it's an Argo. you know, spaceship scale. Another thing that's really bothered me for quite a while is what I'd call the lack of transactional friction. And what I mean when I say that is that it takes the exact same amount of time to load or unload one unit of cargo onto your ship as it does a thousand or 10,000. There, there's no friction, you know, uh, in this process. Right. And I that's completely different from the real world where mom and pop retailers and major port facilities, you know, designed to rapidly load or unload, you know, cargo onto, you know, some big, you know, uh, you know f uh, freight ship are able to move you know, much, much larger quantities in a much, much shorter period of time. And you've got skilled dock workers that you, know, you can actually hire that like are trained to basically ago, deal with special types of materials and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Where, where we're eventually going with this is that shop purchases are going to inject physical cargo into a storage space. And it's then up to you, the player, to basically move the stuff from that storage space onto your actual ship. And there are going to be, I would assume that at this you know, point in time, half of the people watching this are saying that sounds you know, incredibly rough, awesome, right? yeah. and the other half are saying this sounds incredibly <laughs> tedious, and it sounds like a lot of you know, forced like labor that's going to be completely, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, completely right. lacking in fun. There, there is a method to the madness. I mean, where we're going with this is we're going to make the concept of moving freight onto and off of ships not just a logistical challenge, but we're actually gonna make sure that, you know, it's it's a fun, you know, a fun experience. Yeah. And this would include How? everything from eventually adding a service beacon so that you could recruit your friends, your org mates, you know, people you don't know to basically come and help you move cargo. We'll eventually add the ability for NPCs to be to be hired at that location yeah. and the price will fluctuate depending upon how many other players are requesting similar services. Um, and you can use those, you know, types of, you know, ca you know, capabilities if you simply want to pay a certain amount, have your ship loaded or unloaded and you're going to go fly around and do something, you know, completely unrelated. So, Dorsey, how is physicalized car? Okay, imagine loading your Caterpillar completely full for four hours and then space color or somebody coming by and just taking your shit. Cargo going to impact Holy the shit. gameplay experience. I mean, brutal. in a bunch of ways. As you kind of touched on, there's the whole concept of of needing to move cargo from one of those uh, storage areas into uh, that ship, we've actually run into a lot of problems where when you go across, when you come across a derelict, for instance, um, we have all these crates on there that you can offload in, in a lot of the events that we've done. And um, that amount of time that it takes to do that makes it so that when you then go to sell those crates, they can't they aren't worth the time, frankly. Um, yeah, it's because it's, over time. Exactly, yeah. it is so much faster to just park your ship and, and click the button and have it instantly get filled and then drive over to another place and have it instantly be unloaded um, that we can't make those that, that process pay well enough to also be balanced when you're getting 16 to 20 crates off of a ship and it's taking you half an hour to do that. But once you make it so that there is a much more similar timeline between those two. Um, you can make it so that there's a much bigger reward on a crate by crate basis, and that allows us to make it so that derelicts become a lot more common and offloading stuff becomes a lot co more common. There's also just some really great benefits in that we can make missions reward you by putting cargo out yeah, there. That's right. Doesn't have to be that the UEC reward of a mission is is the only reward this mission gives you five thousand every single time no there's the a ship that gets blown up or you blow up UEC. or disable a ship and um, especially disable a ship and then you can board it and take that cargo off for pirates that becomes then the goal like blowing up a ship now becomes almost a failure you don't want to you want to disable it you want to be able to get on it and then you want to take that cargo off and of course the crew is going to be fighting you the entire way there they're gonna um, have their their Can people to try and now? fight off your boarding parties. You've suddenly Maybe transitioned to, into an PQ. FPS yet, map though. by doing so, which is this really great transition that just doesn't really happen in a lot of games, and that's yeah. amazing. And even just from a, a, a pure like gameplay uh, system standpoint of of carrying that crate, that is a a very powerful 
oh, state for the player it. to be in and that they are vulnerable. You can't be shooting a gun and carrying a crate at the same time. That, that's actually uh, my, one of my favorite that was actually you know, a mission uh, in the game. things about this entire process is the fact that we're finally going to reward the player and basically provide this differential in the challenges, yes. you know, to where we've long had, you know, blow the ship up, the ship basically ejects some cargo, you, right. you know, you tractor beam it up and now you basically got your reward. But what it's missing is that 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 transition from FPS mo or uh, from ship based momentum based you know combat to where you know you're shooting your big guns at these things etc and now you're sneaking around corners and you may or may not try to be stealthy exactly. and you're basically trying to extract the cargo out and the crew's basically you know coming out of oh, the security God, areas with of the, the ship mics. and patrolling <laughs> for you and trying to you know uh, you stop you also got friends trying to protect each other too while the other people are trying to move stuff I right and tractor beams are based on weight so it may take multiple people to exactly. actually move a heavier box. And CR wants the, the gameplay experience to be less ships blowing up, more this ship got disabled, the engines go out, and unless there's a critical failure, the ship doesn't explode. So the opportunity to board a ship will be more common as we move forward. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about in this area, and that's, you've, you've heard me you know, talk about this you know, often, which is eventually I want the whole transport occupation to kind of revolve around what I call like a hub and spoke model right. to where you've basically got, you know, big port facilities that are specifically designed to provide the the quantity of inventory and the, you know, and, and, and all of the infrastructure to quickly get that stuff on and off certain ships, um, as opposed to small mom and pop retailers that are really just are intended to deal right in a very small number of items. And one of the, the more significant problems we have in the game, because we don't yet have you know that level of realism, is related to we've got a we've got I a small know, uh, you know we've got a small mom and pop retailer, and we need to have a decent amount of inventory so that it can satisfy demand Ray across potentially a hundred different players, all grabbing theoretically you know, one or two or three items. But what happens in the real game right now, because there are none of these limitations, there's none of this transactional friction is, is Soon. one big ship comes up and it purchases all 300 of them because, because it takes absolutely right. no time to do that. It then flies to a destination and it immediately sells it and it collects you know only the slimmest of profit margins, but because there was no, t no loading time, there was no unloading time, they can still turn around and make a fairly, you know, a good return on the amount of invested time you know they put into it and turning all of this cargo into physicalized entities and basically adding these logistical challenges to where you have to move stuff on move it off you know for, you know you have to be more Thank careful you, with volatile cargo bigger you know crates will require you know argos to move them or cranes or forklifts or whatever the case may be all of this is ultimately going to push players into being more selective about where for whatever they're trying to do what types of the shops trains. and stuff they're going to visit. And what you're going to get is just like in the real world where you'll have super tankers bringing oil from across the ocean and basically parking it at some sort of port facility for offloading. Yeah. And that will then be transported by, you know, whether it's pipelines, by rail, you know, by those types of things to, uh, to distribution outlets. And from there, it'll be picked up by trucks and transported to the local gas station. And from the gas station, that's where you, the end consumer, like can expect to buy what Six or twelve gallons anymore? of gas, but in the real world, you can't, you know, drive your truck up to you know, a port refinery you know, on the coast about? and basically, you know, request you know five or ten gallons of fuel. It's like they they only deal it's a hoax. in it's a hoax. I mean, minimum quantities of ten okay. or a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand you know barrels of fuel. And this will be the same thing that we're going to eventually you know support on our side, to where if you've got one of these big you know, whole sea ships and stuff, there will be specific locations where you know we're we're trying we're, we're we're really basically pushing you to do your business it doesn't mean that you okay. can't go and park at a small place yeah. it's like i can have a super tanker and i can go well, i can go park on the side though right because you do have the docking collar restriction on on the whole sea type okay. ship right and but i think this is what the going to the per box model will actually do for us because we can just make those small mom and pop shops only have the smaller volumes of, of like a, commodities, right? You, you and, talked about how if, if you can only upload, up, unload and offload one box at a time, I'm not gonna do a Caterpillar there. Yeah, like there's nothing there, right? stopping you, but there's something That's just it, if, if, I, if, I, if, if my, if, if my ship no. holds 10,000 units of inventory and I don't have any of the automated stuff and this, you don't have enough dock workers. I can't hire, at this place there literally aren't 
100 NPCs or 500 NPCs that I can hire for any amount of money. They're, they're literally just not there. Stop then you're going to have to do it yourself. Or you're going to have to request some friends to help you. That's and my it's simply to too up, tedious. It, it's not that you, it's not that we literally hours. prevent you <laughs> from <laughs> basically going there and extracting the material. It's that it's simply not going to be worth your time. You're going to have to invest so much time and effort into doing that, that all of a sudden you would need an astronomically high profit margin. And long before the profit margins on that particular you know, come out of your material, get that hot. Imagine someone else with a smaller, more efficient ship that can more you know, effectively, you know, uh, be loaded with a smaller quantity of stuff and then navigate to some, you know, to another small uh, location to basically uh, sell it. They'll wind up, you know, taking, you know, taking that material from that location. Which well, means I, for a cat, like a, a, one of those bigger ships, like one of the Hull series or something, you're going to want to by just that nature, go to a place that has a, a, a cargo elevator that can give you 20 giant crates at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I meant. That's like with, where with, you'll make that profit. With the infrastructure. In it's like some places yeah. you'll have an elevator that basically gives you easy access to 10 crates at a time, and, yeah. a, and a bigger facility will have 50, and a bigger one still will have 200, and this one will allow you to basically hire up to four NPCs, sure. and one NPC can move you know, 10 crates yeah. per hour. But you're going to be in competition with you know with that smaller of NPCs with everybody else, so the price can get fairly high. And it, this other place will have up to 500 or a thousand workers that you can hire. So it may still take you know it may take hours, but you have you know but that's only because you're you know loading 10 you know 10,000 or 100,000 SEU of cargo you know in, into your hold. Another very interesting aspect of this is going to be that you're going to have relatively clearly all, delineated. Okay. This is another thing about CitizenCon, okay, guys? And it's super frustrating. It's constant, and this is just Star Citizen in general. It's the constant discussion of the possibilities that could happen. But everything that they're discussing here now, we will only play a fraction of this in the next couple I of years. I love the passion. But the game is so far away from many of this. It's crazy. This is literally insane. Like that that's the that's the thing. And Elliot's here, he's a, a developer for um the mission team. And just saying Ben's a legend, such a good dev, crazy smart. Yeah, like all these guys are. It's just the problem with them talking about what they can do versus what they are doing is the thing as like a player is just so so tough. But it's good to see you, Elliot. I'm looking forward to uh, to Luke's talk about what you guys are doing. But Transport we're only about routes, a third of the way through Supply routes within the system. So I'm, I'm assuming and we'll get this to your provides us shortly. an awesome opportunity to more precisely tailor what types of challenges you should run into when you're basically moving a big freighter ship from point A to point B as opposed to this other location. In other words, if you think about... You know, pirates are trying to, you know, uh, abscond, you know, they're basically trying to disable your ship and, you know, and, and plunder it, take, you know, whatever valuable materials, you know, you have on board. But the types of ships that would be required to extract, you know, all of Very the fuel yeah. off, off of a big massive freighter are clearly dramatically different than the ships that would be needed to effectively and efficiently, you know, plunder a far smaller ship that deals in a totally different, you know, type of item or a totally different, you know, and more limited quantity of items. And so we'll be able to more more accurately tailor the gameplay experience so that you get the kinds of challenges you would expect. Well, and I think by nature it just it'll it'll allow it to naturally separate, right? You because it's not worth it over here and we can we can make those inventory volumes smaller to match the the type of people that we want frequenting those stores. I'm just not going to waste my time as a, as a large scale shipper. I'm going to go to the bigger places. This is that their can, design that can solution. Faster that I can hire more people. Where there's going to be to other people the there that I can potentially hire, like the empty. service beacon. It doesn't matter if I'm out in the middle of nowhere because nobody's there. The to that have the specialists. It's, 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 it's only at these select ports right. where they actually have trained dock workers skilled in you know, in, in moving volatile cargo. And as if you go to a place where you don't sound, have it and you have, you know, Joe, you know, you know, Joe average, you know, NBC try to do it, to a major then you problem. may wind up, you know, suffering the consequences of, oh, you lost your cargo, it was blown up, your ship was destroyed, you have to go to insurance, you know, reclaim, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all because you basically try. Like a Caterpillar can't go to Terra Mills anymore and just clear out its entire inventory with three clicks, right? 
And like that is like a smart and good solution to the problem. Now, the manual loading and unloading, I think they're kind of also explaining that it's not all that manual when it comes down to the uh, larger cargo ships. He mentioned automation a few times, NPCs. Tried to yeah. Um, yeah, use a facility that was not appropriate for, you know, for the types of actions you were it's trying to do. It's not tailored to it, right? So it's, uh, I think it'll be a good change for the game. The key point from my perspective, though, is... <sighs> But as much as possible, we, we don't want to necessarily make it black and white, right? right? Which is, it's not that you literally, as the owner of a whole sea, you're not able to buy fuel here. It's more that you can buy it there, but it's going to, you know, if, if you're buying more than 10 or 20 units of it, it's going to be, you know, you're going to basically have to deal with the repercussions of trying to get all of that stuff onto here. And it's going to take a tremendous amount of time, and you're going to wind up having to pay an exorbitant premium because you're basically going to be depleting them of their entire you know inventory supply etc and so it's really just you know the 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 logistical challenges that you would face trying to exploit you know non-optimal locations for the unloading or you know uh, for the loading or unloading of your cargo would simply not be worth it well and i think another good point is that as you as you I do not understand the why they need to talk about this for two hours limits, your bid ass spread this conversation is going could have been to over a while ago. be going down as you you know price per unit of the cargo is is going to diminish as you get closer and closer to the inventory limits. So it's going to encourage you to go to places with those larger scale inventories so that you can keep your, your profit margin as high as possible. Okay, this is what I've been waiting for. This, out of all of the things from the entire thing, from the entire Citizen Con, this specific part is what I'm interested in. I'm not looking at you, Twitch chat, because I don't. We completed want to be the basic foundation spoiled. for Reputation late last year, and that followed that up in the first quarter with the release of the Delphi Moby Glass app that allows you to see exactly how different NPCs and organizations feel Delphi. about you. Okay. This is a critical system within the game because it's the key mechanism by which you'll unlock more challenging and lucrative opportunities and gain access to organizations and areas that will bestow various benefits. We're still missing a few key pieces of the puzzle though and can't yet fully exploit this system. So over on the mission side, only the bounty hunting services give you a nice gradation of challenges at the moment, offer you more interesting missions as you gain reputation with them. Can you go into a kind little bit of, of detail about why this is? But yeah, it, Essentially, Whenever we want to make a new mission, or even just a very small variant on a mission, it it requires an entirely new uh, record, a new new chunk of data that we have to put into the system, and that takes time. Um, to build out any kind of, of ladder is is a, a an awful amount of time, honestly. Some things that we want to do is just kind of make it so that some of that is more systemic and a little bit faster. And by doing that, we will be able to kind of um, explode wide, making it so that um, we make one mission, one template, and then just give it some variables That's that have some interesting, ranges. Man. That's fucking um, interesting. And, and by doing so, we can we can then allow it to almost generate its own chains of missions with difficulties that are driven by how much reputation you have. And those can give you different amounts of rewards and spawn different amounts of enemies and um, put things at different distances, etc. Um, just kind of dynamicizing it's a that, I mean, it's a that industry, mission okay. variation. Yeah, and there's there's actually a lot to this, a lot of additional complications the besides the mission, mission itself. System. Because when We've you think about it, on the road map you may have a mission giver, and the mission giver looks at your reputation and decides that he's only going to give you the junior starter missions. And so he calls up the you know go kill bad guys Elliot's in this particular mission. section, and he basically says, you know what, given your reputation, I'm going to assume that you can only take you know a difficulty value of one. And passing a difficulty value of one into that mission will only create one or two guys, and your reward will. Be be, you know, of a considerably lower rate than it would, you know, than what it might otherwise be. As you do that mission, you build up reputation with him. All of a sudden, he's passing, you know, higher difficulty levels into that mission template. And one one of the complicating factors that we face is we need to be able to take this template and before we've actually instantiated it, before you've yes. actually accepted it, we need to be able to extract information out of it and process that. And what I mean by that is we need to know before we've created the mission how much money you should reasonably be paid in order to do this. And we need to know if we need to have a sense of where this mission might actually take you and what the current status of that area is. Or is he sending you into an area rife with pirates or is he sending you into an area that's you know got tons of security 
security and it's the safest thing in the world. Or an active supernova or like any number of things that are terrifying to go. And, and, and this, is, this is part of the reason why we've actually made some significant progress on this particular problem, but there are multiple facets to dealing with it. And I'd actually say that at this point, oh we're in God, a relatively like good you know, place. Not for Star Citizen, because he's taught, again, he's like in the future where we're in the present. Uh, in the future, everything is dynamically changing in this game. It's not static. So when you take the mission in other games, it spawns in all of the um, players and experiences that would happen in that area for you. In this game, the mission system, yeah, there's the mission there, but it has to understand what's going on in the background simulation that isn't in every other game you've ever played. And that's what he's talking about. So this isn't basic. Nothing is basic for this game. And that's, like, the cool thing about it, but that's also the thing that just, like, blows absolute donkey dick about it is because nothing is simple, so nothing is easy to make. Everything takes forever, and it, it it's why we play... We're barely playing anything is because they're they always have this stuff in mind and it just it on sucks. The, on you know on the on the underlying the dynamic mission side and we've still got a considerable amount of work to do over on the actual UI side to take a mission template look at your reputation create some proxy references to that mission template with different metadata associated and then assuming that you actually select option number three which has metadata this then we'll instantiate the mission pass in the metadata so that it actually Actually customizes it as appropriate for the like selection that you were just you know, shown and you can then go off and execute that mission and you'll this be paid the correct amount and you'll encounter the appropriate amount of difficulty for you know for what you were promised and for what he thought you were capable of doing given your reputational level because we already do have in game something that players can kind of play with right now the bounty hunter chain which is effectively what this will look like to players. It's just a matter of that took a lot of setup and now it should be something that we can pretty much like click a few buttons and we're good to go. That's exactly it. like in the end it's all about allowing you to as quickly and easily express a solution to the problem of I've got a mission giver. This mission giver is going to dispatch you to deal with you know with bad guys. The variables wind up becoming well, how many bad guys and how quickly are they going to reinforce themselves and are they going to be you know are they going to be flying capital ships or you know little small horn and what kind of stuff will they have on board and in what areas of the solar system you know, will this conflict be taking place? So th these are all things that we can bend as appropriate depending upon what, you know, what we think you're capable of or what that NPC you know, would theoretically think you're capable of. Yeah. Well, okay, this is from uh, an actual mission developer. He says, this is Elliot, and he says, I can confirm standard mission design and creation is easy because we instance... Uh, things for that individual session, but Star Citizen adds so much complexity and edge cases to the mission because of the way we do stuff, and it's only going to get more complex. Exactly. So, like, you guys just need to understand that um, you bought into Star Citizen because of its complexity, most likely. Um, certainly not because of its simplicity, and that's this is one of the things that um, cause all these delays and problems and everything. Well, and, and we talked a little bit about the procedural character generation uh, in the last USPU sync that we did on for Star Citizen Live, but that's going to be taken into account. The, the back end is going to be generating more and more difficult NPCs based on the gear, based on the quality of the stuff that they can do, their behaviors. So all that needs to get fed into the mission and become part of how we reward the players and, and enhance that experience. But these are all things that are going to be fed into the mission instead of just the static data that we yeah. kind of have right now. Like you, you literally have to place nodes in the mission script logic that, that says like spawn this kind of thing right. if we roll this and this kind of thing if we do that. And it's just, it's It's work, just work, time work. and, and the, this is all data that, that we, as long as we can get it up front, we can pass that into the mission ahead of time and, and actually show that in the mission right up. You know, it's like here's, here's a mission that's gonna take you here and who's offered by this guy, here's General Expect rewards. a medium level of resistance yeah. or this many hazards or... Yeah, fundamentally, that's why reputation is so important is it's it's your... It, I, I it would lets say us see it, how good you are. It's, it's, it's the single most important means of progression within yes. the game. Clearly, you Hopefully. can, you know, you can basically upgrade your character by buying different ships. You yeah. can 
customize your ships. You can buy, you know, different armor and weapons, you know, for your character. But in terms of granting you, you know, membership within an organization or access to areas, you know, um, totally with, you know, with, with, the with more or less hostility, depending upon which organization you're a member of and, you know, what your reputation is within there and how this character responds to you and whether yes. they give you the, you know, the super challenging and lucrative missions or the super easy things that basically just have you, you know, doing, you know, piddly little stuff that, that anyone can accomplish Micro because they don't yet know you don't yet trust you. That's a big um, thing that's... we notice as well. This was something uh, Elliot kind of hinted to us is that um, most of the missions in Star Citizen are being, uh, have only really been located at Crusader and Hurston and now they're being kind of laid out across the entire system. That's what the reputation system is all about. We, we've got, we completed the, you know, as I said earlier, the basic system the last year. Yeah. We incorporated the reputational logic into, the, you know, into the subsumption, you know, mm -hmm. mission and AI language. Um, we got the Delphi app so that you can actually see what your standing is with all these different NPCs and organizations. The one piece, the, you know, the key piece of the puzzle that we're still missing is the ability of the mission system to basically, one, have the mission templates, you know, created that actually take these inputs and then be able to feed them in and have it customize itself as appropriate and uh, related to that is you know and it's no small talent it is a fair is, is going to be a fair bit of work to adapt the the ui to actually allow for this and that's you know just just on a brief aside one of the big tasks remaining on the you know, on the uspu group for next year is going to be refactoring the entire mission interface and converting it from the old flash tech to the building blocks you know tech and and that's one of the reasons huge, why yeah. we made some forward progress on this and then we kind of like waited because anything that we would have done over on the flash side would have been throwaway work. And so we made the decision to basically wait to complete the last 25% of this particular puzzle until we had the correct you know, UI foundation in place, which ultimately, A, it'll make it much easier to implement these changes that I'm talking it's about. A big bit and of B, info you know, we're not going to have to you know, design it, throw it away, UI, and design it again. And, and it doesn't mean that the players won't be able to experience those system. changes in the game without the UI, right? That'll, that'll still be there, but we'll be able to present that and, and give you a better indication of how the mission is going to play out or what you're going to get as a result of the mission with the, the new UI. And, and also, to show you, you know, missions that you don't have the reputation yeah, for. Yeah, right, exactly. Like, it's weird that, that how important that is, but it actually is, is vital that you be able to see, like, hey, I'm not actually with these people. They don't know that I'm that good of a cargo hauler, so they're not going to give me this super difficult cargo hauling mission. Um, that, but you got to know what you're striving towards, too, exactly. as well, right? It's like, I, I, I want to get better at this. I want to do missions with these guys yes. because that's going to push me to go and get that one right there. That offers this much extra reward or this this membership here. Yeah, and I, I, and I don't want to go into this. This is, a, this yeah, is like, it, no, I just mean yeah. this This is Big a topic, topic for another day, for sure. but yeah. I was just going to briefly mention, you know, orgs, perks, benefits. So we're talking about reputation, and you can see your standing with, you know, with different organizations, this with players. Sh this shouldn't and be a topic we will, for you know, day. at some point, you know, next year, you know, that's start to move man. forward that's with... Understand. You know, with with when I say orgs, perks, benefits, you guys know what I'm talking about, which is basically all of the benefits that may you know uh, that may be conveyed upon you just as a result of being within this organization or having a certain level of stature within this organization. This may be anything from you know expedited you know ship deliveries. You know, after your ship gets blown up, you yeah. you don't have to basically you know pay a fee to basically you know get it as quickly as possible. That's automatically covered. You may get you know discounted prices at certain certain shops. Um, you may, you know, simply not get a hostile it response from pirates players. in this area if you're a member of, you know, of the Pirates Guild and things of that sort. And so th this plays into what we're talking about here because you're able to look at an organization, you're able to understand what kind of benefits it conveys to, you know, its most exalted members, and then you can decide whether or not you want to basically try to increase, you know, increase your ranks, you know, within there. and. You know, in in terms of doing that, the challenge is simply having enough mission variety and diversity yeah, yeah. to enable the player to feel, hey, I, I started out, he didn't trust me, he gave me, you know, the real simple, not particularly lucrative mission, and I've been working on this for days and days and days. So this is why they never have designers on ISC. <laughs> and and I've been moving up in terms of the difficulty that I faced, in terms of the reward that I was offered. Talk about all and the finally I got do, to the promised land and now I basically you know, have membership within the organization. Ugh. And now I can basically go to 
this grim hex and have no concern that you know the local you know pirate organization. We is basically all want to play this. We all want to do what he's saying. And importantly, like that is something that makes your character unique in an MMO. Yeah. It's very Seems. important that you bring something to the table that other members of your your friend group might not have frankly, or your organization. You have to come in and say, hey, I actually have access to this really cool mission or this really cool thing. And, and by doing that, I can, can make things cooler for my group. And we encourage that community play that is so vital. Yeah, that, that actually brings to mind, right now we have, we've historically had this faction system that we use to determine hostility. It's, 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 always been, it's, it's, it's always been one of these systems that we know we're going to change it. We know that it's not sufficient you know, for where we're eventually going. Um, it's it's just rigid. never, yeah, it's just, yeah. It's, it's yeah. just never, it's never been a high enough priority. We're getting to the point where we're gonna have to resolve this because the rest of the game is getting complex enough to where it's, it's, it's really starting I to bet, fray at the seams. So earlier this year, we released the Xenothreat mission and that this was is, still entirely Really based talk. upon the faction system of hostility, and that imposed a serious limitation in that. This is supposed to be the talk of everything that we can do, and like these are the guys who make the things that we interact with in the game. Most of this talk has been things that we will not interact with for years. I feel like, and that that's what I just can't deal with 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 this company and the way they communicate to us. It's insane. I have no idea what I will experience in Star Citizen in the next six months um, outside of what's on the roadmap, which doesn't like give a ton of information about like how you're going to play the game that much. And it's, it's just kind of like tough to listen to. It's, it's always the, the possibilities of star citizen, but again, never the realities. While players could join up and basically fight on the side of the UE and try to repel the Xenothreat invaders, there was no, real yes, officially sanctioned you know, means of you joining the side of the bad guys, the yes. Xeno threat. You could go shoot you know, the players that were you know, supporting the UEE. Sure. You could shoot the UEE itself. You could get a crime stat, but the Xeno threat would still view you as hostile. They yeah, would still exactly. engage you, still try to kill you, et cetera. This was something that we got right up to the very end with Nine Tails, and it was driving you and I crazy. Yes. And we wanted to fix it. And we put in what equates to, sure. I'd say, a, it's a temporary hack yeah. to where what we can effectively do the is, is allow okay. a faction I mean, to override thing. its normal you know, dislike of someone in another faction based upon whether or not they have a particular mission yes. token in their inventory. Well, it's if they're doing a certain mission at this time. Yeah. Um, and, and that is honestly not how we want to do this. A hundred percent. So, so yeah. in this particular case, if you accept the support nine tails, you know, mission, Suddenly everyone then flips. they would normally view you as hostile, but because you're holding that, you know, that token, that mission reference, yeah. they'll go ahead and grant you an exemption. But this is, you know, it is clumsy. It was viewed as a, a very temporary solution. The long-term solution that we've always discussed is going to a more reputational, yeah. you know, based uh, you would never you know, hostility get that system. Token until Can you, you go into a little bit of detail about why that's so important and what kind of additional things uh, we'll be able to support no, in the I future the, when we have uh, such a more mission flexible first. system. This is my sure, I mean, the, 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 the why it's important is, is fairly obvious. Like, if I have to make sure that you have a certain mission in order to do something, then I can't say, for instance, you can't go to Grimhex, I'm sorry. You're on the side of the police. Like, d they will shoot you, that is a problem. No, right now, like, they are actually just civilians so that they don't, they don't care, essentially. Um, if it's reputation, it's something that persists. It doesn't matter if you have a mission or not. You have done something that has made these people like or dislike you and no matter where you go and what you do unless that changes they are going to attack you or not attack you and you can kind of count on that well your actions have an impact they do. on how the world perceives you right yep. and it's especially important like as as we go into pyro Yo, okay. as there's multiple factions that are that are kind of at war with each other out there we we want the players to be able to get in good with one or one or the other imagine so, not being so able I, to go I, to grim hacks it, it's a change that it's we know we need to make and i think it's really going to take shape and form as we go into pyro because you do a bunch of bounty in stanton is a pretty you know, binary thing. There's little pockets of pirates, but it's not sure. it's not like Pyro where it's gonna have like these very distinct groups that are kind of warring with each other and we the reputation system is perfect for that. It will allow us to open up also just like an entire branch of content. Like we don't really have 
missions where you work with criminals for the criminals. So there's there's nothing that really makes you a long-term criminal player. Y your crime stat can be wiped. You can kind of you know this, this get rid of that source. It's it's not something that I am a criminal player and I, I I log in and I'm going to do these kinds of things. I'm going to be on this side of things. These people hate me. These people love me. Um, that allows you to define your character, that allows you to define your play style, that allows you to, to define where you're going to do and what you're going to do in the game. The entire game shifts if you have the ability yeah, to say. Yeah, I, I would say it's much more like the real world to where it, it's, you know, the concept of what, you know, hostility, it eventually equates to binary. Either yeah, I engage sure. you, either I well, attack you, or I do not. But in between, there's there's literally just you know a sea of grays exactly. in terms of, yeah, a lot of gray this gray. organization hates that one, this one likes this one, yep. you know, this one doesn't like, this one's neutral towards that one, etc. And you wind up having inevitably some sort of unique mixture of all of these yeah. different things. And so in the end, you know, you'll you'll you know we will prioritize these things and determine it's like oh well you're you know you're a member of you know the you know the walk old ladies across the street well I, I like that oh but you're also a member of the pirate guild I I really hate that so even though I like that one I'm still going to attack you and so it's just it's much more flexible in terms of you know in terms of determining all of these you know complex relationships that players are eventually going to instill so. upon their characters. Like, it's not going to be either I'm left faction or right faction. It's like there's going to be lots and lots of different organizations, lots of different NPCs, and your standing with those will be all over the map. Some players will be in really good standing with this. Some players, you know, will be really low on this other one. And, you know, the, the, the level of variability that we'll be able to support with, you know, with the reputation system is just going to be, you know, far, far superior to what we have now. Where's Luke? <laughs> they showed Luke at the beginning. Dorsey, you implemented the Nine Tails mission, which allowed players to fight on either side of the conflict. How does the gameplay experience differ depending upon which side you choose to support? And can you explain how this actually, in the end, wound up being a server optimization of sorts? Well, I mean, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. What happens differently is if you are on, on the, uh, the lawful side, you are working for Crusader Security, uh, they are sending out scanning ships to try and locate the Nine Tails fleet. Um, and you have to go and protect those. And then once you have found that fleet, you go and destroy that fleet. You are killing ships until you basically deplete their resources and make them hoax. retreat it's from the area. I mean, On the Ninetales okay. side of that, you are, of course, going and hunting those scanning ships. You are uh, given their locations it's and you're told to go destroy it's these. I mean, and then once the fleet industry, portion okay. of it gets found, you go and try to defend that fleet. And if you can hold them off for long enough, then Ninetales will actually uh, win and, and uh, Crusader will be unable to drive them away way before they achieve their their objective essentially which is a, a hidden objective that, that we aren't revealing at this time um, but we are now but well hmm. <laughs> the the uh, the the genesis of this though nine tails was not originally actually supposed to be a PvP event at all it was yeah, much like Xenothreat supposed to be just pure PvE that had performance problems frankly uh, spawning enough ships in a, a pure giant fleet battle to challenge 30 to 50 players made the server just tank. Um, it, was, it was incredibly painful and it just didn't play very well. Um, it also, to be honest, was the same thing as, as what Xenothreat yeah, already exactly. had done. And I wanted to do something a little different. Um, and that, that kind of combined into to this, this push to get um, the aforementioned kind of duct tape solution for hostility in so that you can align on on both sides and by doing that man. I make That's it so that I don't need to spawn ships to challenge 30 to 50 people if things are running smoothly I have 25 versus 25 and I don't need to spawn really just about anything right. you, um, you bring the NPCs in just to flesh to, out to, 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 to fill, even the odds yeah. to get the challenge you know to the level you need um, when has it ever been 25 v 25 ever in nine tails like literally never. When when was it ten v ten? It was always twenty versus one. But when you actually have players that will legitimately fulfill a particular role, you, you take off. advantage of that. Yeah, that no, was a creative way to load balance the mission and yep. the population. In the I, area. I, I would nice. say though that in general, this is one hundred percent exactly what we do want to do, which is we want to give the players. Yeah. 
the total freedom to basically do whatever they want. And right. then, as I always say, it's like, you know, they live with the consequences. They live with the repercussions mm -hmm. of their actions. If you go and support Nine Tails, if you support Xenothreat, it's like that will have, you know, an impact on okay. how people view you. You know, the yeah. aforementioned reputation system and you're standing with, you know, with key NPCs within the game and how you, the UE views you and, you know, whether or not certain organizations want to allow you within their ranks. And some of these things you do will have long-standing impact yeah. to where if you ally yourself with a group you know uh you know like the nine tails you may be prohibited from joining some organization that yep. you've been aspiring to for a very long time unless so, you do something to work that back like yeah, you've got well, to earn it's a that balance, trust right and, yeah. and and we want we want those scales to go one way or the other it's not that we want you to be able to be perfect with everybody all the time like that it comes at a cost. It depends upon the severity, right? Which is, if you do jaywalking, well, <laughs> then sure, someone is not going to find it that difficult to basically assume that from now on, you'll stay on the right side of the law, so we'll go ahead and you let you into our transport guild. If, on the other hand, you're you know, committing acts of piracy and murder and everything else, it's like, oh, well, now I'm not sure that I actually want you in our organization, all which sides? adheres to cool all to the laws of the nearby area and everything of that sort. That element of being able to pick your side and, and do what you want to do in the game is something that, you know, because of that we want to allow in pretty much every piece of our content going yeah, forward. It, it needs to be as much as possible. Ingrained in the game with yeah. everything else. The only reason we haven't you know, traditionally supported it is, is it's the tech. It's it, it's well, and and to a large degree, you can call out a yeah, few specific like pieces Detox. of the tech, right? Yes. Which is the reputation system certainly plays a role. About um, as the, you know, the as lack of a reputation-based hostility been. system. We're still using the old faction system for Xenothreat. That was literally the number one reason why early in the development process we nixed it on Nine Tails. We were literally within weeks of release, and it it. it so it, it, would, it, it was going to bother me to yes. put out a second one yeah. that had the exact same yep. limitations as the first. And so despite the fact that it was going to be you know, an unattractive hack to fix it, yep. I wanted to fix it. It, it did. It completely changed it the did. experience. And so it, it is you know, what I always refer to what as it's Jay duct walking, tape. We'll get some value street, out of it as soon and as quickly as we can you know, convert the hostility system over to the, you know, the proper reputational version. We'll do that. Um, but in general, for the short run, we can continue to use this hack for some other missions that we have in the hopper. And once we have that reputation version in, like we will update Ninetales to handle that, and it will play better as a result. Yeah, that, that's actually another uh, point that I want to like touch on a little bit, which is so we did Xenothreat, and we released it, and then we basically brought it back, and you know did some relatively mild alterations. We changed how the two middle phases basically transitioned automatically between them, as opposed to being distinct, so that we could have the whole salvage process and then you had you know the climactic battle and it kind of like rolled around but there was still salvaging you know during the later part on nine tails we basically released it and you've already identified a number of shortcomings with yeah. it that you want to address not just for 315 but even beyond that and yes. this is this is something so i want to i want to get to that in a second but this is something that we're going to continue to do this with a lot of these dynamic Nine events. They are intended not as one-shot missions. You play them for you know a month, a quarter, you know six months, and then we lose interest and we move to other stuff. The uh, the basic idea for these things is these events represent some sort of you know archetype almost yeah well I, i'd say they they represent it's almost like a customized chunk of gameplay it's yeah. pirates have locked down an area or xenothreat has decided to invade the solar system or pirates have basically run amok you know over in Nine this area yeah, or you know, drug runners have completely Nine you know seized like control of these you know manufacturing facility you know et cetera et cetera and the idea is that we'll have all of this information over within quantum and then we'll look within our yes. extensive library of these events, and we'll decide which one most closely you know, matches that. We'll customize it as appropriate, and then trigger. And so the idea is that we're we're layering all of this this custom handcrafted designer content onto this systemic background, yes. and so we really get the best of both worlds. We get you know a nice logical systemic universe that ebbs and flows. It evolves. It basically changes logically in response to player actions, but but at the same time, we get all of the you know incredible stories and the explicit dialogue and the intricately designed challenges that a designer has put a lot of you know time and thought and effort into doing, um, and so you really get both of these blend together. But back to Nine Tails, so 
On 315, we're going to tweak a couple of the problems that you've identified. So you want to okay. start with that? They're relatively small things, honestly, just due to the schedule. It's probably the most impactful one and the one that I've seen the most people talking about. There is a portion of um, Ninetales on the lawful side where you can deliver medical supplies to the blockaded station for a bit of an extra reward. They will pay you a little bit more if you have a certain mission. Um, and also their inventory just is just very rapidly depleting. So you can aspect. pretty much always sell there That's and, and they, you will be selling at the best price that they can offer. The problem that occurs there is that everybody buys all of the medical supplies out there. And while that's really cool on a realism statement, with, with the game in the state it is and with trading in the state it is, that means that a lot of people can't participate in that part of the mission. And that's wow. problematic, um, particularly at this right. point where we want to be testing how those play. We really want people engaging in that part of things. Those of you who were part of the, the first wave of Ivacati when we first tested this way back might actually remember that we originally had shop modifiers on the places that were selling medical supplies yes. to make it so that they had a higher inventory that refreshed fairly frequently so that everyone could kind of engage in that. We were asked to remove those so that we could emphasize the derelicts, which are around the station that um, you can take medical supplies off of, because basically the derelicts made it so that there was another way to get those medical supplies, but they didn't. It, it, it took so much more time that there was really no the reason event. to do that if you could do well, the it trading. It actually goes back to what you were talking yes. about earlier, which is I can buy them instantaneously from the shop and there's no loading right. time and then I can move them over here and I can instantly unload them. If I had to physically pull them off, you could more easily balance these things. Whereas right now, I really do have to go manually pull each individual one off of the derelict ship. And so I'm incurring all of the you know, the physicalized cargo expense on one side and not on the other. And so in the end, sure, you know, just due to the sheer amount of time, it's like it takes me 30 minutes to get 12 boxes this way, or I can go buy 50 boxes, you know, in a I split second. Which one ship. are you going to do? Some people might still do the derelict because they're fun, frankly. It's a fun little FPS raid, but yeah, a lot of people are going to look at the, the the dollar signs and just go, okay, this is obviously the better option. I think that that was being when said, the mission team we're probably going to put back Xenothread. in. It's actually a pretty easy, I left them in there because I had a feeling we might want them back. Uh, we're just going to flip a switch and probably put those shop modifiers back in. We, we've seen how people play the derelicts. There's plenty of them in Xena Threat. Um, we want to see the trading, frankly, and, and so that will allow that to come back online. Another relatively small change um, that, that, that is probably going to be coming in. We are seeing that many people are not engaging with the criminal side of things, and that is very much, like, the whole thing that we were doing with making it into a PvP mission for, for uh, the purposes of, of okay. helping performance We're gonna have to gets, better gets entice them to basically so, fight on you exactly. know, the side of the Exactly. We, we need to entice them. So that means, I mean, they already are being paid more than the other side. I'm probably going to up that even more, oh, frankly. They are going to become matter, very lucrative, Money hopefully. That is the short-term solution, and, 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 and this is where, like, ideally, you you know, helping but out the Nine Tails, building reputation. Becomes Ideally, easy. we would be able to yeah. offer Long other term. benefits so of being exploits. in that organization, other things that some percentage of the players would aspire Money to and SC's want, you know, other mean. rewards that you get for build, you know, for building up your standing with them. Which won't be for 315, yeah, but, but that is definitely where that is intended to go. The other thing that we might want there is a system to dynamically modify jurisdiction, because one of the big punish points that happens to a criminal when they are uh, helping on that side in that area, despite the fact that Ninetales has supposedly taken over this area, when they get killed, they go to jail, which right. is a bit weird, frankly. We, we originally did want to make it so that you wouldn't get brought to jail, but there just wasn't enough time to fit the tech into the schedule. There still won't be for 315, but that is a longer term thing that we want to have, is the ability to kind of dynamically modify these yeah, jurisdictions. Yeah, but it, that's just light on a problem, right? Yeah. Like, it, exactly. Yeah. It was one we kind of saw coming, but frankly, it was good to have it confirmed, and now we can hopefully put some pressure on that, that happening. Yeah, we, we, we were a lot of those. Like, we added, yeah. this, we added the shop modifiers, we added the probability volume modifiers, we added the ability to do, you know, the quantum lockdowns, you know, Know, through the dynamic events and stuff, we haven't yet added the ability to add the, I think this is the, the dynamic worst panel population made, modifiers. And so this so one early. was, as you Getting said, we knew way. this was going to be an issue. You can't necessarily I get everything you'd like into every one. release. And so the point is, we got nine tails out. You had some other longer term yes. things that you wanted to address as well. Can you talk about those? It's, it, well, some of them, frankly, are just things that are going to be uh, things that will naturally happen, to be honest. Um, 
performance is uh, still a big problem. I do want to like talk to the performance thing for you know for a second, which it is some progress. Huh? It's been we we basically generated something on the order of 120, 130 okay. different individual gyros um, that people were addressing in the run up to Xeno threat. Because what what inevitably winds up happening is is we get performance to a certain level, and then we're at, you know, we're basically adding Tweaking. more locations. We're basically enhancing the AI logic. Yeah. We're adding you know new functionality, and so it's 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 always a running battle to where you're adding more you know you're adding more stuff as you're making other stuff run faster, yeah, and so you tend to get a net wash. And we actually ball. found ourselves. With Xenothreat, one of the reasons we held it for a couple of extra weeks was we wound up finding ourselves in a very bad spot to where there are inevitably, there are, there are problems now, we're very familiar with them. Um, they were much worse, you know, just a few, you know, uh, you know before, when we were originally yeah, supposed to release it. We fixed just, it was in it so was many. an endless litany of these things where it's like, you know, on profiles, you know, things well showing 100, up, yeah. you know, stalling the main thread, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Those are getting cut down to a millisecond here, two milliseconds, but there's just such a quantity. And so the what I want to touch on a little bit is, is as we finalized some bits of tech, like part of the reason we were able to devote as much time to getting things back into at least, you know, uh, what I'd call like, you know, an acceptable state, not a great state. We've got a lot, you know, <laughs> we've got a lot more work to do to get this thing to uh, the level of performance we want. There's a lot of problems, you know, the rubber banding that you know, we're intimately familiar with. We absolutely positively want to deal with it. It drives us, we, you know, we all hate it. You know, we want to fix it, um, but as, some of these people roll off of things like their server meshing, you know, tasks and stuff. We're now getting to the point to where we can keep people focused on this particular yeah. problem for, you know, certainly a longer period of time than they've been able to do in the past. It's just a matter of that being the focus. I, that, that's exactly it. It's, it's just a matter that's of it being the big, focus. I hope a lot of you are having a nice day. So, so, like, for Smile. all the PvP. For all the PVPers like crying about desync like nonstop, like it's kind of exhausting to hear at some point. That is like the answer that all of you probably needed to hear was that okay, these guys are doing all of these things for server meshing. So it's literally not that server meshing fixes desync, it's that server meshing pulls them finishing their task for server meshing pulls them off to focus on that literal problem for more than a day or something however long a long period of time that tony mentioned there so that that's what that always meant and it kind of is what it is like when it comes to everything that they just said now the things that are supposed to fix nine tails that are coming at a later date that won't be in 315 well nine tails is still gonna suck in 315 and the things that i'm looking forward to in the game suck too and they won't be fixed until Post 315. Server meshing are the we people all are that are in the same boat. These optimization yeah. problems, right? So your your game's gonna run as fast as your biggest bottleneck, and that's about it, right? And you're gonna hit the next one and the next one, and you're gonna keep fixing them until your game runs. A yeah, it better. was it was almost an endless litany of spawn stalls, the entity you know deletion stalls, and it, it was impressive to see how quickly those guys were eradicating you know some of these really really Big egregious ones, like, you know performance you know impactors. Like, Three, four hundred millisecond spikes going down. Go, going down to one, like, or yeah, one or two milliseconds. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah absolutely. Enormous. We we spend a lot of time crafting to make sure that like this the, these waves are coming at the appropriate amount of, of, of um, difficulty for the number of players that are there and and all this stuff. And if the spawn queue starts to slow down, that kind of snarls. It doesn't. It just doesn't work. You can't design a great experience. You can design an okay experience, but not a great yeah, one. As, as you know, on, on Nine Tails, I know we, we we played with this quite a bit. Yes. We definitely did on Xeno Threat, where it's like, well, we want to bring in 10 guys at once to present right. a certain amount of challenge, but then yeah. you've got to like spawn them all simultaneously. And so we wind up bringing them in one at a time. So we're basically distributing yes. you know, the spawn load over time. And while it's true that you know, on average, the, you know, the amount of, you know, uh, you know, challenge you're going to face will be identical. Mm -hmm. There is a big difference between yes. sh 10 ships showing yeah. up at once versus one. And it was the same thing with the number of capital ships was originally larger and we had to whittle that down. And so as the performance gradually improves, obviously we'll basically start to expand our ambitions in terms of, you know, what we're, you know, what, what, what kind of experiences we're actually putting out there for players. And the existing ones will just improve, frankly. Those missions will almost become new beasts just by the very nature of that happening and that's that's what when when you say like what is the long-term thing that to me is is the biggest thing because a lot of these events will just be better 
You're currently working on a sequel of sorts called Jumptown V2. Can you go into some more detail about what players can expect from that with the initial release? Yeah. It's, it's actually, I'm trying to keep it very, very simple. Uh, Jumptown was originally this, this community event, uh, and, and I want to keep that, that vibe as much as possible. I, I'm, I'm trying to have a very light hand. So what I'm doing is I'm basically taking a location, um, I'm going to make it so that it starts to spawn physically um, a bunch of boxes of, of a very lucrative uh, uh, material, in this case, maize, commodity. Um, and and uh. it, that will then, uh, it'll start to spit that out at a certain rate, which will, will entice people to go there and, well, and, and collect it, put it on down. their ships, fly it away, whatever. Um, but 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 the 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 point there is that that is an area that will be very very lucrative for a, sh a short period, which will entice a lot of people to conflict over it. Um, like the physical box thing. When when you've got a place that is that is popping out a box of maize for free that you can just pick up at every thirty seconds or so, like that is that is dollar signs and and people will kill for that. Not only because it's fun, but also because it's it's worth it, frankly. So so essentially there is a location, there is a, a thing that spawns these boxes, and I'm going to turn it on. And that's about it. One one of the things I didn't like about the original Jump Town was it was at a fixed location and it was always on and it basically spit these things out at a certain frequency. Outside of the fact that it was a bug, but well. yeah. <laughs> So, but but it was it, it, was, it was very static. Yes, yeah. that, that that's exactly it. And in, in general, I I just I hate static things yeah. because you know it, it's 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 always the same. So how, let's talk a little bit about Jumptown V2 is being designed as a dynamic event, yes. and it's also extremely I configurable. Got so yeah. We're going to start with support for any of the drug labs, the three. although that's really just a function of whether or not we could get environmental art team support Correct. for the other areas. Longer term, we will be able to activate this yep. at you know at a wide variety of different locations. The, we the all, concept itself is pretty simple, and it can be worked at, at all these different places. Yeah. Um, sorry. Sh sure, but but there there's a lot of things like uh, we put a lot of thought into recording additional lines of we dialogue did. to support different types of you know you know drugs or different types of commodities. Yep. You know, we have some generic lines so it can apply to you know all the stuff you know that's anything. You know, we don't want to be stuff. hampered by that because the the the, the lead-in time for for getting that dialogue can can be a little bit. Um, uh, damaging to doing just quick ads, frankly. Like, we want to be able to just say during a quarter, hey, you know it would be really cool? If there was an underground facility that was pumping out data or um, metal or, or at a refinery, and we want people to fight over that, and we can just add that because we, we so, planned ahead. So we've got dynamism for Jumptown V2 with respect to location. location. We've got dynamism with respect to what exactly it's going to be pumping yep. out. Another one that I wanted to support was the quantity. In other words, how, how long how will fast, this thing be much. spitting it out? Is it going to spit out 100, you know, you know, 100 SEU of cargo or 1,000, you know, 100 units of drugs, you know, you know or, or 10,000? And Ooh, this was something, God, again, so it's been configured as a dynamic event to where it can have this this information passed into it and then configure itself as appropriate at runtime like that means whoever yeah. or whatever if that's it, the critical it, part it, it, it currently is is launched by a person who is literally like pressing a button on a on a page um, and when they do they can enter in a bunch of variables and and those will determine where it's happening what it's spitting out how long it's going to last sure. how fast yeah I, I i'll actually talk about that a little bit later sure. to where right right now you know all of the events that we've launched so far are triggered you know via quasar and a person goes in specifies the event and, specifies the inputs. You know, and you'll talk about it being yeah, 100 percent Jumptown V2, an another one of the specific design objectives was to use it as the first test case for these systemic triggers to sure. where we can Yo, actually have really? quantum inject this information dynamically. Yes. And so like right now we're running nine tails and one of the complaints that I've seen is, you know, hey, it doesn't fire you know, often enough. It's like I missed it and then it's gone. And so one okay. of the you know, one of the directions like, in which we I'm want to go again is having some of these events, like Jump Town, which can be triggered by player by, actions, by player actions the, or quanta or player yeah. and quanta basically doing whatever we determine. Maybe it is a certain amount of drugs are being bought, sold, inter, you know, yes. lots of you know, drug runners are basically you know, traversing this shipping lane. Whatever kind of you you know, conditions we want to okay. put. Jump Town V2, they want to be the, f and this is this is the goal of it for like, so these events always had goals in mind that would push the development of Star Citizen forward. Dynamic events, 
Nine Tails Lockdown is like was the one supposed to be one of the first things that interjected the uh, commodity price changes or whatever, right? A quanta thing. This is supposed to be the first mission that is triggered by player action in your server. So it would not happen unless those actions were completed by you. So you were the one who triggered it, not some dev at a desk in Austin. But and then we can measure you know, both on the quantum side, you know, eventually, and then you, even in the short term, you know, on the players, is like how many players are basically moving drugs back and forth here? Yeah. How many players are basically, you know, dropping commodities off at of this location? And if we have a dynamic event compatible with whatever these, you know, with whatever these, you know, uh, whatever these conditions are, then we can go ahead and automatically trigger it and inject, you know, inject those customized parameters into it so that it, so that it basically more accurately represents what's actually going on in that area. Right now, we're just shortchanging that, but, but eventually, yeah. Th Drive that's it. that's actually you know I, I I like the whole you know jump town concept, but I, you know my my favorite aspect by far is the fact that it's being designed as a test case for some of this you know up and coming you know systemic yeah. technology on the back end, so that we can start to go oh it's at a three a.m. conditions you know were met and we're going to go ahead and trigger jump town you know on you know on on Lyria and we're basically going to put this particular drug into it and it's going to be six hundred and seventy nine you know units to drugs and you know however quickly you know if players are there and to basically whatever you know, happens, pull those happens. things out that will be how long it lasts and so all of a sudden you have you know it's it's a transient event which is sometimes we may inject you know we, we if we can scale this however we want sure. such that you know when these conditions are met do we take the total number of you know, you know delivered and they'll drug, hint you know, at the trigger but they won't tell you the 10. exact so we can basically turn it into something that's going to range for an hour or a day or 10 days or whatever else but we can we can add that variable factor to where it's not always a constant it's not always you know on for the entire you know for, you know for the entire lifetime of the release it's not always seven days there's actually going to be you know uh you know it's it's going to depend upon what is really happening within the world. Isn't it risky that's having to an event dependent on a certain customized. population committing to gameplay they may or may not game. participate I mean, it's, in? Yeah. It's, you, it's no, the, because it is a test case for what Star Citizen is. That is literally Star Citizen. Is that holy shit that pause natural based. events triggering <laughs> in the world you mentioned people on... saying like nine tails wasn't happening enough and they would log on and they would wait for it to happen that is not the goal the goal is i log on and to i see something happen. is happening there should always be an event of some kind that you could go and do maybe you log on and you want to do this particular thing but also oh man that's happening right now cool Kind of thing. So yeah, there will be there will be, there will be some of both. You know, Xeno Threat is the obviously big, yeah. you know, the big ones, and then you've yeah. got what I'd call like you know the the, the mid range you know things like the Nine Tails and stuff, sure. where you're locking down an entire area, and all of a sudden we basically we've cordoned off you know. A region, and we're not allowing you to easily transport you know, uh, you know, quo. cargo, you know, back and forth to there, which basically starts knocking the prices up. Which is why we added all the, you know, the price alerts and things like that, so that you can actually be enticed by the fact that oh, this area that's been choked off. They really, really need copper. They're willing to pay this. Yeah. Don't you want to try to break through the blockade? That actually does kind of get to uh, what you were saying earlier in terms of allowing some of the player ships that are going to, or some of the NPCs that are going to interdict you to actually be more effective at it yes. as we start to expand yeah. those quantum interdiction zones you know, it, to a larger size. It all interconnects. Yeah, and it could be influenced by players or the back end yes. simulation. It's, it's it's something that we'll be able to balance. We'll be able to pull analytics from the back end. It's it's measurable, and it, it'll be something we can tune over time. An another one on on uh, another point we're talking about on Jump Town for future directions forward is, and you and I have had this conversation a couple of times, is I would like to eventually be able to have NPCs basically fill in the other side. Like oh, right yeah, now, sure. one of the ah, inherent flaws okay. in it is it's purely PVP, right? Which is, I go there, I basically you know, control that area, I get the loot for as long as it's pumping it out, and unless other players come and try to basically kick you out of that area, it's, it's a cakewalk. And what we would want to be able to simulate, obviously, is, we're going, you know, if if players are not going there, There's you know, loop. would would Quanta, you know, over on the Where's simulation side, would they be attracted to, you know, this value generator? Of course they would. Great. At at what rate? And that what rate's going to depend upon what it's spitting out, what later, the street, how much you know, later. value of that stuff is, how far it is from civilization, and they therefore have to travel, et cetera. And so the point would be that we want to be able to, just as we were talking about earlier, we want to, be, you know, with nine tails to where we were aligning, you know, players on either side, saying we'll use NPCs to basically, you know to balance it however we want. In this case, 
if there are zero players on the you know, the, you know on the attacking side trying to like take it over, well, we're going to have to fill those ranks with NPCs. That being said, one of the things that is called out very often as being an exciting portion of Jump Town the original was going there and not knowing if you were going to find resistance. That can kind of keep you on the edge of your seat a little bit. There's that, it's too quiet. So Thank it won't you, always a be. A hundred, a hundred percent, yeah. but, but you don't need th that, that uncertainty Fucking doesn't Tony necessarily to need to only have come too as a result of whether sometimes. or whether or not players are willing to do it. We can have uncertainty on the NPC side and say, exactly. maybe we will, maybe we won't basically, you know, have them assault. Maybe they'll come in a straggler, one guy at a time. Maybe they'll come in a big coordinated group of 12 NPCs, Our all in heavy right. armor, armed safe, to boys? the tooth, and, you know, and, and you'll basically be doing your absolute best, you know, to, you know, to hold that, calling your friends, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the point is, like, right now, unless Unless we have the ability to basically set those scenarios up, then you know th some players on some servers will never get enough. that cool experience yeah. of a whole burst of guys you know arriving at one shot or the stragglers. Now, if players are basically going in there attacking, well, sure, I've already got 20 yeah. players on this side. Maybe I don't need to throw any other NPCs out to you know to. Or maybe I want to add fuel to the fire, frankly. Or, like or it, maybe you want to throw it, yeah. Players it, the, were very creative in the first one. Yeah, <laughs> like and and that's honestly what I'm really looking forward to is is what is. The, the tools that have been added to the sandbox at this point, it's such a simple event. I really am looking forward to seeing how they, they handle it. Like, you can come in in a, a land vehicle and you can, you can set up a tank or a ballista and just like pick people out of the sky, defend that area, turn yeah. it into a fortress. You can have dog fights in the air over it. You can, um, if you're stupid and you leave your ship turned off with its shields off, like someone's gonna blow that I, up. You and I talked in the early They're gonna early blow it up anyway. about the fact that it's a drug lab. Why is it basically spitting, you know, spitting these things out? And the idea would be, well, they've produced a lot of them at that location. And so who would be one of the most logical people to come and try to take back control? It would be the guys that, you know, that basically, you know, Originally had control of that drug lab. It'd be you know whatever you know uh, criminal organization we to want to basically yeah. have that thing or and a competition. A hundred percent. So you could see you know, I mean, it's players are in there basically to, like, reaping the rewards. Chess. Another you know player when team assaults like the game them, needs and to now be more the checkers, much dude. much larger threat comes. And the players you know it could be a three way. The could players can team up yeah. you know with each other to basically hold we them off and split the in goods, this game. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Controlling so the, 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 the real point to my mind is it just comes back to is configurability, which it will is be different. I wanna I wanna be able to vary the location, vary the you know, the type of material, vary the quantity of that material and the frequency with which it's produced. I wanna be able to vary the challenges you'll face trying to basically hold it. And all of a sudden that starts to become representative of what we're trying to do with all these different dynamic events, which is yeah. We have a, we want to make templates that we can. You know, I always call it object-oriented content creation. You know, it, it's such a common concept over on the coding side. You don't really see much focus over on the content creation to basically put all of these rules and procedures and processes in place so that you can basically build nice modular chunks of content and easily link them to other pieces so that you're not reinventing the wheel every time you're doing this uh, like a good you know uh, you know a good example is the spawn clauses that we're doing you know over for some of the infiltrator missions that we'll be talking about it's like that's absolutely going to play a factor in some of these you know future iterations of things like you know whether it's nine tails you could see nine tails eventually you know supporting on the derelicts some of those derelicts actually have nine tails members on them that we can yeah. basically create two or 20 you know we can create them over time we can basically you know change you know the you know, or taking what over the station are. like there's so many things you yeah. can do with that so yeah pyro is going to be is this a, the a scam game i was going to be an amazing the, test the strife for that. that is yep. supposed to be going on out there so yes looking forward to it, it. All right, let's bring Luke into the it's conversation. A it's a hoax. I mean, okay, so we started working on the Xenothread okay. event around March of 2020, and it took about a year to get it out the door. We knew that it was going to be extremely difficult because we were missing so much of what we needed, no, including everything hoax. from it's the dynamic hoax. mission I mean, service that would drive the industry, back okay. logic to the capital ship AI, target prioritization for turrets, functional countermeasures, tons of dialogue, and countless other things. Part of the allure, though, was that in one shot, we'd have a great test case for a litany of important features, like battles far larger than anything we'd previously done, and a test bed for creating missions that supported a variety of different play styles, like ship-to-ship -ship combat and salvaging. So, Luke, from your perspective, what were some of the big lessons we the learned NPC's from Xenothreat? just standing there, dude. Well, Xenothreat was our first attempt at a large-scale fleet battle, so we learned a lot. 
The biggest takeaway was that we needed to develop our overly simplistic friendly fire system, which was leading to players receiving unfair crime stats and being kicked from the mission. So in the recent re-release of the event, we made major improvements to our friendly fire detection and tolerances, which drastically cut down on unfair crime stats, according to the feedback and analytics we received. What's great is this kind of change improves the whole game, not just the event, and yeah. paves the way for more large-scale space battles in the future. I think it's also important to add that another thing that became clear was that players wanted a counter mission involving PvP. So we've started planning with this in mind for subsequent releases. Luke, as the performance gradually improves over the next few quarters, what sort of things would you most like to change about Xenothreat? I think most people would expect my answer to be throw more AI at the player. But it might be that when performance improves, our AI becomes much deadlier, which could actually yeah. lead to us reducing their numbers. And this balancing is always the most difficult part of mission creation. The AI's performance can be wildly different on our local servers versus what it might be like on an overtaxed live server. And if an mission is too easy, it's not just a case of throwing more AI at it, as this will only compound the performance issues. We were happy with the balancing we achieved, but it wasn't quite what we hoped for. Once performance has improved, we hope to rebalance and deliver the experience we intended. Luke, we've invested a lot of engineering effort into our spawn closet tech, which allows us to precisely and intelligently push NPCs into and out of an area. The first major test of this tech will be the infiltrator class of missions, which I wanted to provide much more varied and challenging FPS situations than anything we've previously seen. To that end, we can now determine at runtime the type and number of NPCs we want to insert at a location, often at the behest of quantum. We can also apply a litany of rules to the spawning, like how many can be active at once, how the spawn rate changes when an alarm has gone off, and whether a boss might be found wandering the area with his guards or only after they've all been dispatched. The mission template supports a wide variety of objectives, ranging from killing everyone at that location to only killing select individuals, <laughs> yeah. to protecting NPCs from any harm, to hacking computers, to extracting designated materials. That's why I can't look at you guys. Can you go over some of these mission variations in more detail? Of course, Tony. The underground facilities were the locations we chose for our first implementation of spawn closets. So this is where players will find new missions, as well as some existing missions that have been vastly improved by the addition of spawn closets and non-combatants. One of the new missions sends players to kill a heavily armoured target who only shows himself once his crew have been wiped out. Rashala? Another involves the player searching a friendly facility for a number of boxes, identified using information provided on their Moby Glass. At any point during the mission, small enemy assaults can be triggered, and the thing I love about this one is that players can choose to avoid the fight and gamble on the facility's defenders being able to repel them. And the last one I'd like to mention is, thanks to spawn closets, we now have our first FPS defend mission, where players join friendly AI in defending a facility from multiple waves of enemies. And the nice thing about this one is that in addition to the basic mission reward, Players also receive bonuses for the AI who survive to the end. Some of the benefits That's from this mission template are coming from smarter use of existing tech, like more modular subsumption logic, and some of it stems from new features like the spawn closets. Luke, how has the design setup of the infiltrator scenario varied from what you've done in the past? Well, spawn closets have had a dramatic effect on the types of missions we can build. Without them, we were unable to spawn AI mid-mission, as we couldn't risk them spawning out of thin air without warning. Wow, he spawned That's really unfair on players. Thanks to spawn closets, we can now spawn reinforcement waves and spring ambushes anytime we want, with players able to recognize where AI is likely to reinforce from. Not only does this allow us to build brand new mission types, it allows us to spawn manageable amounts of AI and only reinforce when some of those are dead, to better balance the difficulty of the encounter. And you mentioned we're building our logic in a modular fashion. And the Eliminate Boss mission is a great example of that, because we've essentially taken the Eliminate All and Eliminate Specific objectives and combined them to create a new experience where players must draw their target out of hiding by first killing all of his crew. Luke, another mission template we're currently working on is called Rescue Transport, and it revolves around getting NPCs to a specified location. One of the variations allows the NPC to request personal transport via a service beacon, just like a player, to a designated location. Other this variations involve Elliot's adding work, assorted complications guys. to getting the NPCs on board your ship, like having to first outsmart or outfight their captors, unlocking their prison door to release them, safely escorting them back to your ship for transport to the desired drop site. Longer term, we're going to add support in this mission template for a lot of other combinations, like having to drag unconscious characters onto your ship and back to a hospital and trying to lead NPCs through a burning ship. 
Luke, where do we stand with the current implementation of this and what remains to be done before we can push it out the door? Well, Tony, we're at the point where we have a working prototype in which AI can be asked to follow, wait, and take a seat aboard your ship. Wait, is that following? And even with this rudimentary setup, we've been able to flesh out the mission flow to a very detailed degree and have made a lot of headway into planning the dialogue requirements. We've got some effort to make sure that the mission is more than a delivery mission where the box has legs, so the client has patience that can wear thin, <laughs> with your that? tip and rating He's... being calculated. I'm not going to go back, but he's sitting in the chair that it isn't We'll down. also be developing AI behaviours to deal with what happens should the player decide to kidnap them. The rescue mission module has been designed in such a way that it can work in conjunction with others like Infiltrator, meaning that we can easily inject some obstacles in your way. Like it was a my first panel captors. detox. And, uh, These missions will drive the development of AI following. So abruptly. once complete, we'll be able to leverage that throughout the rest of the game. I want to pivot now and give an update on some of the systemic functionality that I detailed last spring. All right, here we I go. I said that we were soon going to have quantum controlling a few select bits of the universe and that we were going to be very measured in the rollout. We remain on track to activate these changes with 3.16 at the end of the year, and this initial release will okay. allow Quantum to dictate three encounter frequencies, the prices of three commodities, and everything related to Combat Assist service beacons. Three commodities. As the simulation okay. is refined and more of the linkage to the game is completed, we will expand the scope of these early tests and enable Quantum to play an ever larger role in shaping the universe. So let's go over how the gameplay experience is set to change. Okay. Okay. Three commodities. This is very weird, but... Probability it. volumes dictate how the likelihood of an encounter type varies within that region, and historically that information has always been static. Dynamic events, introduced in early 2021, allow that data to be changed by mission logic, but still don't support systemic modulation. You can see the frequency curve for pirate activity in red on the screen here, and the long and short of it is that no matter how many pirates you, your friends, or the entire community kill, the likelihood of encountering a pirate at this spot right here would always be about 5% per minute, and farther out, right about there, the odds would drop to 2%. Now, let's see what happens when we activate Quantum and it starts to provide real-time guidance to the probability volume service that controls this information and distributes it to the game servers. As is often the case with such demonstrations, the simulation is running at an exaggerated rate of speed so that I can easily illustrate some key points. The first thing you'll notice is that the fixed pirate curve just flatlined because Quantum says there aren't currently any pirates in this area. There are some valuable materials on the surface of Selen, though, and that's starting to attract some quantum miners represented in green. The distribution of the miners determines the shape of the green curve, and the quantity determines the amplitude. With the value of the ore available on Selen sky high and no threat in sight, the number of miners continues to increase, and you can see the encounter curve changing to reflect that. Pirates are drawn to high concentrations of wealth with minimal security, though, and are starting to swarm into the area, and as they do, you can see the red pirate curve adjusting. Quanta security, represented in blue, is drawn to conflict and is thus often a lagging indicator of criminal activity. So at this point, there are several distinct things happening. The number of miners in the area is still increasing, but the rate of increase has slowed dramatically as they start to weigh the increased risk of piracy. The number of pirates is still increasing because there's still sufficient value in the area to attract them and not yet sufficient security to dissuade them. The number of security forces continues to rise because the pirate problem is raging out of control and thus security pay in this area has gone through the roof. This trend continues for a while until finally the risk of piracy gets too high and the quantity of miners starts to drop. The pirates are doing their own independent mental calculus and still see sufficient value in the area, even once the miners start to fall off, to continue increasing their numbers, but that simply speeds up the rate of decline in the miners while at the same time the threat from security continues to grow. So, eventually, the number of pirates in the area begins to fall off as well. It, it, it's cool to see all this. It's just... I'm curious how... Like, this is just not the... I don't know. This is as just the not threat the of piracy the begins game, to subside, weird. the impact gradually ripples through the economy, lowering the rate of pay and demand for yeah, security I'm gonna let services. I'm going to just keep going and... The quantity we'll of security forces us. streaming into the area eventually peaks, too, then, and begins to decline. If you watch the curves, you'll see a rhythmic action to it all, with miners looking for high-value ore in safe areas, pirates searching for unprotected wealth, and security chasing conflict. Three different but very interdependent calculations. 
The system is always searching for equilibrium, and just as in a real economy sometimes overshoots a bit in one direction or the other, which ultimately equates to opportunity for the thinking player. MBC Combat Assist service beacons have historically been generated via probability volume data and were thus every bit as static as the encounter frequencies that I just covered. The odds of a request for combat assistance at a given location didn't vary based upon what was happening in that area at that time, and no amount of concerted community effort to stamp out what was putting those NPCs in danger had any chance of succeeding. To illustrate what's changed, let's jump back to Quantum. The miners are back in force, but there aren't yet any pirates, and thus there aren't any requests for combat assistance. Just as previously occurred, though, the pirates are going to slowly sniff out this opportunity and begin gravitating to this location. This has to be sped up, As their right? numbers increase, so will the odds of conflict with the miner, and thus the likelihood of a combat assist service beacon being issued. You can see a few contracts now, represented by the green icons. Quantum is dictating how many beacons should be present in this area in the exact details, such as how much Alpha UEC is being offered, but the data is actually maintained by the service beacon service that interfaces to the game servers and exposes these contracts to players. So, every contract that you're seeing pop up, which is a direct result of the amount of conflict happening within Quantum, can be seen and accepted by someone within the actual game. Security has started to show up, but isn't yet a major force, and the risk of piracy has gotten so great that some of the miners have decided to exit. The frequency of combat assist beacons is a function of both the quantity of miners and pirates, and clamped by the minimum of either. So, as the miners depart, the number of outstanding beacons drops. Security has now reached the point where it's really starting to deter the pirates, and the reduced number of miners is just adding fuel to the fire. So, now the number of pirates starts to fall off pretty dramatically, which also impacts the total number of active beacons and instantiation frequency. Player actions are fed back into Quantum, such that if a lot of beacons are accepted and the NPC is successfully defended in the game, the security risk as perceived by the pirates in Quantum will increase, thus affecting their sense of whether the risk justifies the reward. This means that not only will the system ebb and flow of its own accord, but your actions within the game will directly impact the simulation and thus the overall state of the universe. There's one other important thing that I want to mention here, and that's the value of the additional context that Quantum is providing. We now know exactly who issued the request for combat assistance and even yeah, the likelihood that multiple there. ships might be involved. All of this information can be packaged up and associated with the beacon so that when and if a player accepts the contract, the instantiated mission can be customized to better reflect what Quantum says you should be seeing. That's kind of cool. This is one that really matters too. The shop service has always had the ability to modulate the price of commodities based upon things like the amount of inventory on hand and its rate of change, but we haven't really exploited that feature for some of the basics like fuel and HPMC, which is the material required to affect repairs on a ship. One of the reasons for this is that it's one thing to have tradable commodities fluctuate in value according to some algorithmic logic that doesn't consider anything beyond the confines of that particular shop, okay. but it's quite another when those materials are critical to playing the game. Now that we can properly gauge demand based upon factors external to the shop, though, this even if the simulation logic still needs a lot of work, we're going to flip the switch and let the prices of fuel and repair materials start to undulate. So let's bring Quantum up again. The Tram and yeah. Myers mining outpost on Selen has been selected so that we can see its real-time prices for plasma fuel, quantum fuel, and HPMC. Keep an eye on these prices as the Quanta arrive on scene. A few of the miners are from distant locales and will be looking to top off their quantum fuel tanks, and that increased consumption is causing prices to trickle up just a bit. Plasma fuel is jumping quite a bit more, though, because it's in constant demand due to the fact that the miners routinely have to traverse the surface of the moon looking for valuable deposits of ore to extract. The price of HPMC hasn't budged because there hasn't been any conflict in the area, but that's about to change. The pirates have started to arrive and attack the miners, and that means that there are going to be some damaged ships that require repairs, and the price will continue to rise as the amount of conflict grows. Pirates require fuel, too, and most of their need revolves around the plasma they'll use to engage ships in close proximity, so it's starting to get fairly expensive. Security forces have now started arriving in force, which means even more conflict in the area, which is why the price of HPMC has finally started to take off. Security forces burn a lot of plasma fuel hunting for pirates, and this is proving to be more demand than the local stores of inventory can satisfy. This means temporary shortages and skyrocketing prices until either the demand debates or the economy rebalances to ensure a more regular supply of fuel to this area. Here's the thing that's weird about this is, sure, this is something that's going on around Selen, um, but...
if you could just fly to Daymar to refuel. Like, okay, the the amount of time it takes to fly from Tram and Myers on Selen to Daymar, which may not have a lot going on, and refuel for a cheaper price is not dissimilar to, like, just... It's such a short amount of time. It's like going to your local gas station already. So saying, like, that one area is... You know, the prices are so exorbitant. Seems like a little bit crazy when maybe just across the street, it's almost like saying gas on one side of the street is $5 a gallon, but on the other is three, which is, is like just a total drastic difference. Up until now, all of our dynamic events have been. So I've gone and passed up all your stuff. No, we talked about it. The 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 dy dynamism of those missions is crazy and the specific like boss guy like a tarkov uh boss is crazy it looks really cool i haven't passed up any of your stuff we, we already watched it been manually triggered by someone loading up quasar selecting an event specifying the input variables and activating it this works fine for major events that are intended to run for a long period of and time, but it's credit. problematic when the event needs to run multiple times per day or only when specific conditions warrant or needs to be customized based upon the current state of the universe. Yeah, I watched it. The solution to this problem is systemic triggers, which are small analytical programs that let us specify what sort of conditions within quantum warrant the creation of a dynamic all event all awesome. and allow that event's inputs to be mapped to all sorts of simulation state. I'm going to bring Quantum up one last time and highlight the location of the three drug labs within the Stanton system. Raven's Roost is on Microtech's moon Calliope. Okay. Jump Town is on Crusader's moon Yella. And Paradise Cove is on Arc Corp's moon Lyria. For this test, I've removed all commodities except for drugs, and thus any green quanta you see moving around are focused on moving these illicit narcotics. A systemic trigger has been set up that monitors the total drugs purchased at any of the drug labs, which you can see in the graphs below the star map. If the total amount of drugs purchased at one of these locations over a period of time exceeds the specified threshold, it will trigger the Jumptown V2 dynamic event. The location and quantity of drugs sold would be passed to the event as inputs, which the mission logic might use for any manner of things, such as temporarily overriding the shopping data at that site for the duration of the event. Interesting. The shop service that communicates with the game servers is linked to Quantum, and thus all player transactions in the game are filtered back into the simulation, and their purchases are therefore... Oh, yeah, look, there's active dynamic events. Infiltrator, Pyromania, Rescue and Transport, Xenothreat, Ninetales, Lockdown. So these are some of the others. Just as relevant to the totals as those initiated by Quanta. All of the drug labs are seeing a bit of action, and Paradise Cove looked like it might be the first to breach the threshold. Some red pirates have started moving into that area now, though, and the green freighters have started to flee. It looks like they've decided to focus on Raven's Roost, and you can tell by the constant level of elevated purchases that they're probably going to trip the trigger pretty soon. There, that's it. The conditions for the systemic trigger have been met. You can see that Jumptown V2 has now been added to Quasar's active dynamic events list at the top right, and below that you can see the input parameters that it was sent, which include the Raven's Roost location and a numeric value of 916 for the total purchase drugs variable, which the actual Jumptown V2 logic uses to configure how many free units of drugs the location will produce over the lifetime of the event. The ultimate purpose of systemic triggers, then, is to allow us to easily and programmatically dictate when and exactly how handcrafted custom content will be layered onto the background tapestry driven by quantum systemic logic. As our library of dynamic events grows and the sophistication of the simulation evolves, you'll eventually find that it's difficult to tell where one system ends and another begins, and the whole experience will just feel more engaging and unique than what either technology could deliver by itself. Okay. Conclusion. That's it for our show today. I hope that you now have a better sense of some of the things we're aiming to accomplish over the next year and that you're as excited as we are about the potential of these new features and technologies to really transform the gameplay experience. Until next time. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> no dates? I mean... I, I don't really need dates. Like, the thing that I really need is <laughs> that, that goodbye. He's literally an NPC. He's actually a fucking NPC. But anyway, 
the um everything that guy said was bullshit <laughs> no it wasn't so the thank the, you the thing that i feel is good about this talk is that this is what they plan to do in the next year <coughs> who knows if it, it'll be what they get done in the next year but it's their plan uh, and I think instead of CitizenCon being so out there like it has been in the past, I think it was sort of refreshing to see something um, planned for sooner. So, yeah. Can't wait for you to summarize this video in Week in Review. Ha ha. I won't be um, at all. So it'll be all these all the Week in Reviews will be very short summaries.